What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man, it's Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. This is a continuation of the first video I did a week or so ago, uh, which you guys really liked. So I figured I would kind of continue on with the saga. It was the top ten tips or lessons or you know takeaways from the 2018 fantasy football season. We are continuing into part two. We're gonna rattle off maybe ten or twelve more. I am joined today by uh, Justin, as he put it, a random guy that I found on Twitter. He is from uh, Father Son Fantasy Football. He made an appearance on my channel earlier this year, sometime uh, during the summer, and I've kind of bounced around to his channel a couple times as well. It's kind of his first year um, really diving into fantasy from like an analyst standpoint, so I thought he'd be a really good person to kind of have on here because, um, you know, you guys watch a lot of content creators. Uh, Justin was probably someone who did that prior to this year and then he dove in for the first time. So I can imagine he took in a lot of uh, stats and numbers and analysis this year. So it's gonna be interesting to see his point of view. So Justin, welcome, say something to the uh, big dog country over here. What's going on? What's going on big dogs, yeah. Um, definitely learned a lot. Like you said, the first video, if you guys haven't seen that, I watched it, it's a great video and you can kind of take whatever tips we learned and apply it to yourself so you don't make the same mistakes that we learned where our now mistakes, I guess you could say. Yes, so, exactly. Excited to get into this one and talk about things that we can improve on for the years to come. For years to come, for centuries. Yeah, so centuries to come. we got we got a list here and we're kind of just going to, you know, talk through them and have this very conversational. So yeah, the first one I have on the list is to get a Twitter account, guys. My like number one, I should have put this as number one in the last video. Twitter is the most helpful social media, the most helpful tool that you could possibly have for, uh, for fantasy football. And I see a lot of guys are like, oh, get the sleeper app because they give you instant updates. That's what Twitter is, except you have every fantasy football analysis is opinion and analysis right on breaking news all the time. So if, get a Twitter account. And if you don't know who to follow, this is not me plugging myself, but come follow me and then follow the people that I follow. And my Twitter account will be down here somewhere or something. So I'm telling you, if you're only on YouTube or if you're one of those old spirits and you're like, I don't use social media, I promise you this will uh, up your fantasy game like times a thousand because you get to constantly interact with the Evan Silvas and the bigger names in the industry. So like Justin, did you have, uh, I mean, this is your first year, I guess, having a fantasy football Twitter account, you know, specifically for that reason. Were you on Twitter at all prior to this year? So I have like five Twitter accounts, but like this <laughs> one I have specifically for fantasy football. Before I was an quote unquote analyst, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. I had a Twitter account for fantasy football. I didn't really follow, probably follow like 40 guys, like my favorite guys in the industry. And that was two years ago. And that helped my fantasy football game improve just that much because it's articles and stuff don't get updated and magazines don't get updated. Whereas Twitter is constantly updated based on what's happening now. Like it's all fast right at your fingertips. Yep. So definitely helps out and i think if people don't have a twitter account you're basically doing their bird box challenge with fantasy <laughs> football and you're not you're not going to make it far some people can do it some people get through it somehow and get one championship stuff but if you get a twitter account it just ups your game to the next level because like you said you follow every single one of your favorite podcasters article writers authors and personalities for fantasy follow up to like 600 people like whatever like, you know interact yeah. with people you get different thoughts and all that so yeah you get the value like the same way that we try to bring value via podcasts or youtube like y people are giving off a lot of information or analysis that they do on the side you know that you wouldn't get via youtube like i'll randomly tweet out a lot of statistics that i wouldn't maybe say throughout one of my videos or my podcast that you'll miss out on if you aren't following me on twitter so uh, i would just say general rule is get twitter because it's definitely the best social media platform when it comes to fantasy football content because it's quick you get a lot of good hitting analysis and especially when something like uh the carlos Hyde trade you know goes down and nick chubb's on the waiver wire like you're not going to know that for maybe like 20 minutes you might not get an espn update but twitter will have that within five seconds of it breaking like legitimately so get yourself a twitter come follow us our socials will be down there and then you can follow the people we follow and that'll get you uh that'll get you started on there um, but breaking into more like fantasy football, actual analysis, things that you guys can do for yourself. The next thing I had on this list is following the snap counts, right? So when you look at box scores, you'll see yards, you'll see touchdowns, you'll see targets or whatever. 
one of my biggest takeaways from this year was to really follow the snap counts of players, especially in the preseason. Because in the preseason, you know, you can't go by box scores. You can't go by those things. But the preseason is where coaches will tip their hands um, to where they see the starting roster really kind of coming around to to be, right? There's going to be a lot of running back by committees and a lot of camp battles, especially at the running back position, um, that you hear a lot of rumors and reports on throughout July and August. Once preseason games kick off, though, the coaches have to put their best players there together because they want to know what they can run, you know, with this guy on the field and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, fantasyinsiders.com is a free website that you could use and look at player snap counts. And I know just off the top of my head, like people weren't sure if Christian McCaffrey was going to be the workhorse in Carolina, but in the three games that Carolina played in the preseason, he was seeing 95, 97% of the snaps. So that tells you those things. Uh, Peyton Barber versus Rojo as uh, a running back battle, right? You heard the rumors like, oh, Peyton Barber's got the upper hand for becoming the starter and whatnot. People didn't really believe it. But then when Peyton Barber was getting, you know, 15 um, of 16 snaps with the starters and uh, Adam Leviton writes a great piece every preseason uh, weekly on snap counts and the biggest takeaways from those snap counts. So I would say... Go by snap counts over targets or carries or things like that because that tells you who is going to be on the field for um, for more time and that will eventually lead to more opportunities. So was that something you uh, started kind of looking at this year or was it or was that not really even on your radar yet? No, hundred percent on my radar. I was uh, everyone thought C.J. Anderson for the Christian McCaffrey situation was going to be a factor. I bought into it before preseason, and if you're fortunate enough to have your drafts after week three to preseason. The snap counts would have told you McCaffrey's going to get used like a workhorse, and you saw that happen this whole season. Not everything in preseason is going to stay true, but like the snap counts especially seem to be the most, I guess, correlation with the carryover because Rojo, what did he do? Nothing. Exactly. And you saw Peyton Barber get all the work. You saw Christian McCaffrey win people championships for that second-round value that should have been in the first round. So mm-hmm. definitely snap counts, and I didn't know that before this year, so definitely going to focus more on that next year rather than just picking up like a few guys because there's definitely some guys we missed maybe and mid-round value guys so definitely yeah snap counts and for, i th- i think goals. i think uh you could pick up on at the wide receiver position this happens a lot too because you know their volume wide receiver volume is very it, it fluctuates on a crazy crazy you know scale on a week over week basis but if you're looking at a guy who might have like 10 targets one week and then three targets the next week you can look at their snap count and be like you know, is he actually playing that much, right? If he's getting 95% of the snaps, right, but he only got like three targets this game, there's a good chance that eventually he's going to start seeing a bigger increase in volume. And that was something I picked on on like uh, DJ Moore. That was a piece of analysis I used for him midway through the year where he was only getting like 30 to 40% of the snaps. After their buy, I realized that uh, they put him on the field now for like 75, 80% of the snaps. And that's when I was like, even if he only went like four for 40 after that first game back from the buy, and, uh, and and he was starting to see the field more, I was like, now's the time to pick him up because they're playing him more. But like the average fan would only look at box scores and be like, ah, he didn't have a big game. He's not ready to blow up yet. But volume, being on the field, snap counts are is something that's kind of predictive in that sense. So um, that's the way to head, get ahead of a game. So snap counts over the box score is something that uh, you guys should definitely implement into your analysis. What do you got for uh, next on the list, Justin? Next on the list is if you know, you know. And... Uh... That's Bush. just how it yeah. is. I messed up on that this year. But <laughs> if you do, if you know, you know. And that's in the first couple of rounds, the first three rounds, I'd say. Um, you, I think what I didn't do this year was I went for the upside. So you take guys, uh, I know you mentioned David Johnson, your last one, who you kind of knew, but like you had to off your injury, new coaching situations. There's a lot of uncertainties with that first four uh, picks. Mm-hmm. And I had the opportunity. I took David Johnson because I was high on him too. And I missed out on a Gurley who I wasn't the biggest fan of this year. I thought regression was going to come. But the Gurley, same situation. So you knew he had the same situation. You knew he was going to get used. But I somehow in my head doubted that. And you got other guys like I know Thielen, people were saying regression was due. But that first half of the year, the, the dude went bonkers. So yep. And he helped you win games and you could trade him and all that. So, yeah, I wouldn't overthink the first couple rounds. I would shoot for more guys who score and are stable and not, like, question marks, I guess, per se. Because you had all those uh, – Doug Baum was a question mark going this year, still going early third round, yep. late second. So if you avoid those risk takers in the first rounds, you're, I believe, better set up for success in the long run. Yeah, it's, it's more just like it's, stop trying to be too cute. And I, yeah. I've, I overthought it. I think that happens all the time. My friends at my draft, like my hometown draft, you know, uh, 
it'll be like draft night. And one of my friends asked me this year, he's like, do you just like do so much analysis that you start to overthink everything? And I'm like, oh yeah, absolutely. Like I'll start making bad picks because I get in my own head, you know? And especially in the first few rounds, I think like minimizing risk is something that I definitely will probably be doing. Um, you know, that will definitely be pieces of my draft going forward and, and not taking those risky guys in the beginning because if you miss on those on those guys in the first, second round, you put yourself at such a disadvantage. I agree with that. And you got leagues too where people don't trade. I'm in one of these leagues where there's like no trades that go on. So I know the whole thing is you don't win your league and the draft. But if you know your league and you know like there's probably one or two trades a year, you're basically betting on who you draft and some waiver pickups. So and waiver pickups are shaky depending if you have fab or not. So yeah, definitely don't overthink the first couple rounds. And like you said, us doing so much research tends to lead us to overthink and make last minute changes, which I think is hard to avoid, but definitely something to keep in mind for next year. Yeah, I think uh, as we approach the NFL draft, one thing to keep in mind also, um, which is kind of next on the list, it, was, it, it I wanted to talk about rookies, and I, I wanted to talk about how every piece of like analysis based around rookies is like overemphasizing their draft capital. Now, for the most part, from like a general consensus, first round rookie running backs are supposed to be the starters for the team. Second and third round rookie running backs will compete for the starting job, not necessarily, you know, become the starter right away. And then fourth to whatever free agent is kind of up for grabs. And you might make the team, you might get cut from the team. But that's really how uh, a lot of people look at it from a general sense. Now we've kind of come to the fact that uh, that's not always the case. So I would say, you know, first round running backs should be given the starting jobs, but that's not a piece of analysis anymore. Like all summer you heard Rashad Penny, He's the first round pick. He has to be the starter there. And it was like all all summer you heard Chris Carson is the starter from their beat reporters. He looks the best in that backfield over and over and over and over and over and over again. And if you watch if you watch the snap count totals throughout the preseason, you f- you figured out that Chris Carson was the guy. So my my thing is like when you start getting around to the NFL draft, even like the the senior bowl, right? When there's no other football going on, that's the only that's the only analysis you hear. So you tend to hear so much about Rashad Penny because we didn't um, we didn't have any football for three months. So you start overemphasizing guys that you just hear their names so much. So if you're like, oh, I kind of like uh, I kind of like this guy, you're gonna love that guy eventually. So it's like don't overestimate the value of a guy just because that's the only thing you're hearing. And um, unless they're picked in really like the top 15 or the top 10, I don't think they're guaranteed a huge role. And I don't think that should be like the main piece of analysis for rookies really. I 100% agree. No one's safe basically outside of top 10 because a lot of people, Rashad Penny, I saw him when my home was going to fourth round. Just not even based off the preaching thing, just because, oh, this guy was a 28th pick overall, whatever he was, and he's going to get the starting job because why would you spend that first round pick on running back? Mm-hmm. Well, frankly, NFL people don't know what they're doing, I think, in my opinion. So why are you taking running back? So you can't just go off based off picks unless you're a top 10 pick because you're going to get used. You're not going to waste a top 10 pick on a running back. We say that until Seattle gets top 10 pick at the same thing again. <laughs> no way. They would <laughs> never fucking use that pick on them again. I think they're uh, I think they're done drafting running backs for the foreseeable future. They got like seven guys that just rotate on the IR. <laughs> they, got, like, they really do. One, one guy will be healthy there. per week, so they'll be all right with that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's so hit or miss. It was like, if they're, if they're top 10, I would say the average top 10 back, NFL draft-wise top 10 back, I believe, I, I forget what the stat was, but they get somewhere from like 280 to 300 touches in their rookie year if they're a top 10 back. Makes sense. They're the workhorse on that Last team. Three, I remember it would be Zeke, Saquon, and Leonard Fournette. And all yeah. three of those, as one healthy, of course, get the work. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then this year, you know, we had within the top 40 picks, we had, um, it, it was like on and off. It was like, yeah, Sony was good. Rashad Penny, not good. And then it was like, Rojo was terrible. And then Nick Chubb was awesome. So it's like, it's very hit or miss. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're analyzing uh, rookies. And... Yep. Uh, I think we'll we'll move on. What do we got here? Yeah, don't chase those playoff numbers. So this all goes back to small sample size. So this year, you had a guy named Derrick Henry uh, <laughs> do nothing for owners from weeks 1 to 13 to the playoffs, basically. And most of those teams that had him were in, like I'd say, the lower half of the seed for uh, come playoff times. And once they have him in the playoffs, some people didn't start him. But for weeks 14 to 16... He had 94.2 points in PPR, and that was number one ahead of McCaffrey and even ahead of 
Deshaun Watson, Aaron Rodgers in a four-point pass touchdown league. So this guy just went off. So you're going to see people gravitate to this guy come draft season, and he'll probably be a top four-round pick because people tend to forget what they did earlier in the season. And I think small sample sizes are a trap. And you don't want to fall for that, making, I guess, illogical decisions. Yeah, Derrick Henry is going to be a really interesting case this summer. People are going to love him, and people are going to absolutely stay away. So I don't think you're going to find an in-between when it comes to him. And speaking on another Titan, this was a, uh, some of the analysis I did for Corey Davis coming into last year. After his rookie year, you know, he was banged up a lot, and we didn't have a great piece of uh, NFL game film, I guess, to really sample him. But people were going nuts about his one game in the playoffs against the Patriots. And uh, I remember, like, he, he scored two touchdowns. He didn't really even have that much production besides the two touchdowns. But, like, it was like 40% of his yards, 40% of his catches, and one of his touchdowns came on the final drive in garbage time. So I was like, people are clearly just looking at the box scores. Small sample size doesn't really tell you anything. So when in doubt, uh, and if you only have a piece of sample from a player that's small, fade that. That is never a good, uh, that's never a positive thing to go off of. Nine times out of ten, those don't work out. Derrick Henry is going to be a very interesting case. Um, I think he was horrible all year, and I still don't think he's a good running back. I think that if they give him 20 to 25 carries a game, yeah, he'll be good, but I don't think that's like the best course of action for this Tennessee Titans team. I don't know. Where, where are you like, where, is there anywhere you're comfortable taking him? Um, I'd say if he falls to the fifth round and I already have two running backs, I wouldn't mind having him as a flex because maybe – Hopefully, just something week one or two. If they keep the usage which he had in the playoffs, which we don't know, but if he does keep the usage, I try to trade him ASAP. He's the kind of guy who, as soon as you see a good game, it's going to be tempting to keep him because, yeah, he had like two touchdowns or whatever, but I try trading him as soon as possible based off of that because in the history, the past two years, he's just not known to be a trustworthy, reliable starter. Yeah, that's, yeah. It's they... tough, very tough. Very, very tough because it's enticing because if they do give him 25 carries a game, you see that and. I don't know. It's also you got to look at the situation, I think. Like, the situation in the playoffs, they, nothing was working for the Titans, so they started giving them the ball. And teams going against them, they just – Jaguars defense did not play well that game at all. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the if you look at the teams that he played against, they were all pretty much out of the playoffs. It's weeks 14, 15, 16. Derrick Henry's well-rested. He didn't get a lot of carries throughout the year. Now you're giving him 25 carries. He's fucking 300 pounds against defenses that aren't, like – they're like, I'm not going to lay my body out on the line in week 16 when we have no shot of making the playoffs. I'm not trying to tackle Derrick Henry either. So I think there was a lot working against that. And anytime I've really went against – anytime I've, I've made picks based off small sample size, I I end up regretting it. Very, very, very often that happens. So another one this year was also Robbie Anderson, who I took in drafts because of what he did late last season. And this come – I drop him. Don't pick him up in weeks 14 to 16. He's the second highest scoring wide receiver behind Hopkins. So nah, I think another trap there is in Robbie Anderson. But it's different because a lot of analysts on Twitter like him. But like you're saying, is fade the public. So I'll be fading Robbie Anderson come next year. Yeah, Anderson's another good uh, another good case there. I kind of like Anderson. Um, I think, well, I kind of did. And then they brought Adam Gase in. And I thought that was just the worst fucking hire of all time. I think Gase is going to run that fucking franchise into the ground. Uh and, and like Hopefully. every <laughs> everyone was everyone was banged up on that team, so it was like you didn't have Darnold the whole time, you didn't have Kinti Nunwa, you didn't have a lot of players, so it was really hard to get a grasp on what that offense is actually going to look like, you know. So um, Robbie's a guy I, I like as a late round pick, um, you know, second year with with Darnold. We'll see what happens there, but same point kind of remains there. I can I can I can understand that. Um, okay, so we want to talk about slot wide receivers. Slot wide receivers are becoming so prevalent in the NFL today where it's almost to the point that they're as valuable. You know, you're just not getting those prototypical wide receiver ones on the outside anymore. They don't, they're so few and far between, right? It's like the last time we had one of those guys come in the league was, uh, I'd, correct me if I'm wrong, but was it like Julio and AJ Green that year? Have we had like a real prototype come in since then? Hopkins came after. I think that's the okay. one though. Okay, yeah, and he, he definitely bad, wasn't like, like too long said, after. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's been a while since you've seen like that big physical wide receiver outside stretching. So, and you see nowadays the NFL is moving to more, I guess, not just targeting one guy. You see less targets to the number one alpha unless you have a Julio Jones and whatnot. And uh, I remember Sharp Football was saying before the start of this year how more targets were going over the middle of the field because defenses are like playing outside and that's going to be the tight end. And 
slot wide receivers. This year wasn't a great tight end year outside the top four. And slot wide receivers like Adam Humphreys, people were sleeping on him. Look what he did this year. Consistent in total playoffs, you could say. And you got slot guys like Zay Jones towards the end of the year against crappy defenses regardless, but he was getting more targets and Foster did move in the slot. You saw Michael Thomas even get moved to the slot now. Yeah, he's running like 35% of his routes from the slot now, and he kills it from in there. I would like it, it, it kind of blows my mind that if offenses put their players into the slot, right, their best players into the slot, those big slot wide receivers, I don't, I understand that the defensive scheme might not play towards that, but like it, it would make sense to put, if you're going to have your best cornerback play on the outside against the number one, why not move him into the slot? It doesn't make a lot of sense to me why defensive coordinators don't move that but yeah man like for every d hop or julio that you have the nfl has guys like tyree kill obj Diggs, tyler boyd dj moore calvin ridley you know tyler lockett amari cooper the list goes on and on and on and uh and and the guys to really look out for the guys that i think are really like going to explode and, and be league winners over the next couple of years are are those big slot receivers the guys who are made to play the slot uh, but they also have a lot of size because normally you just throw your smallest guy in like a Humphreys or a fucking Cole Beasley or whatever. But over the last couple of years, we're seeing like Juju is a big dude, but he, he pretty much it. exclusively plays the slot. Adam Thielen runs 75% of his routes from the slot, blown up. You know what I mean? So like those are the guys, Cooper Cup, 6'2", 6'3", had tons of success rookie year, was blowing up last year until he got hurt. So it's like when you know that a guy is going to man the slot for his team, it's easy targets, easy to get open. The quarterback loves that part of the field if you know a guy's gonna play the slot and he's a big athletic strong fast height all that stuff that's a guy you want to have on your radar for sure yeah 100 percent. and i think you're gonna see more offenses moving their bigger receiver into the slot because juju didn't start out in the slot a lot he played in the outside first couple games of the year then i don't know what mike Pound did but he started moving in the slot more and that's when you saw him just start taking over and keep that consistent production up because more targets for the slot so definitely going to be looking at the slot guys for future years and try to take those wide receivers. How are you feeling about Juju 2019? Oh, I love Juju 2019. I've been, uh, I'm a big Juju fan just because like, he is like my age, but he's a little older, but like same thing. And I'm just a big fan of his game, his personality. And I think another aspect you can't really measure in football is like the mental aspect. But this dude just loves to play football and he wants to get better and he's always trying to get better. And you saw this year he worked on his route running and he did amazing. And I think if AB does go to the 49ers, which I think is going to happen, this guy's going to be fine taking an alpha role because you saw AB's absence did not affect him how some people thought he would. So I think he's still yeah. going to be an alpha receiver getting over 130 targets next year. Yeah, I mean, the 130 target mark, I think, is almost a given for Juju. My 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 concern actually is that if Antonio Brown leaves that Juju, I don't know if he could play the alpha role, to be honest with you, because I remember when he was coming in um, or coming off of his, his rookie year, like last year, uh, Matt Harmon does reception perception where he breaks down the success versus, you know, man coverage, zone coverage or whatever. What he found was like Juju was not good against press and man coverage, but he was really good against zone coverage, which is what you see a lot of the time in the slot, right? You don't have a guy usually sticking with you. You'll, you kind of work the soft parts of the field over the middle of the field. And Juju's really good at finding those holes. Same thing with Cooper cup. My concern is that if he's outside and he's, and he's playing against press coverage, man coverage against the top cornerback, every play, it's going to be a lot tougher. His matchups are going to be, you know, without Antonio Brown, who else do you really have to defend on that team? So this Pittsburgh team could, uh, I don't know, their offense could be a little, um, could be in for a, a downfall without Brown there. Kind of scares me. Yeah, it's a little nerve-wracking. I think that people are going to hype Juju up because it is Juju. So I can see him being a second-round pick. And I think the earliest I'll take him would be mid-second round if to, like you said, diversify my shares and whatnot. Yeah. But I think end of second round is where I'd be comfortable taking Juju is it a risky pick? Yes, but I think the target floor and the opportunity is there. Even though he's going to get press covered, I think he's going to work on it this offseason and not become great at it, but definitely improve his numbers against the man coverage. Yeah, I mean, end of the second round, I'd absolutely love that. I think uh, by the time like real drafts come, you know, September, late August, I I think you know, uh, I think he'll be a top fourteen pick. Like I think he'll be going pretty early. Um, I can see. Yeah, and it's not like I don't know. There's not. I guess there's not much downside to it. Like what's the worst his floor could possibly be it's still going to be a very good season regardless you know so it's not a bad pick he just i don't know if he has that prototypical like would i take him over like a julio jones if if you're going to be picking around the 14 like no way those are the guys that are probably going to be in that you know 8 to 13 range and i i'm not going to take him over them because i don't think he has that ceiling yeah it's going to be if he does go top 14 i feel like in home league drafts because a lot of people aren't in expert league drafts he's going to go earlier just because of the namesake and 
And I think Pooley would probably go before him, but I think it's be him or Tyreek Hill and, like, those kind of things. And uh, Tyreek Hill wins you more weeks, in my opinion. More boom bust, but, like, definitely wins you those weeks. So. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's probably a good comparison. Like, my home league, I know Juju... Like, whoever owned Juju last year is going to love Juju, and they're going to want to take him really early, you know? That's the no thing. One's gonna, yeah, you don't, no one really hates Juju, I don't think. Yeah. It's hard. <laughs> um, what else we got? So, we want to talk about the different league types, man, because fantasy, I mean, if you've been following my channel, then you know I'm, I, I've kind of been interviewing people that are into all these different types of leagues, right? And now they have redraft leagues, which is your typical setup with your friends and you draft a team and then once the season's over that's no longer your team hence the word redraft that's the type of league that most people play in with their friends and family now you have dynasty leagues <coughs> you have best ball leagues you have all these different types of leagues so depending on you know what your um interests are when it comes to fantasy football there are a million things if, if you're <coughs> if the best thing about fantasy for you is drafting Go play in a bunch of best ball leagues because all you have to do is draft. You don't have to set your roster. If you like the idea of trading, if you like the idea of operating like a GM, then dynasty leagues are um, are, are for you. Now, Justin, I know um, you're obviously big into season long. Did you get into best ball at all this year? Uh, did you get into any dynasty leagues? Like, what do you? What kind of diversification we got over there? Um, so I had like two main home redraft leagues this year and i had a couple other ones with friends and stuff but two like i guess bigger money leagues mm -hmm. and then i had i did four startup dynasty drafts this year so i have four wow. dynasty teams that's stressful it's a lot who did you one. Who, who did you take so, who did you take in all four leagues that you really regret doing because i have a feeling you definitely did i'd say so one of them I come on with my dad's friend because he wanted to get into another dynasty league and he's a big Mike Evans guy and we were in the second round we took Hopkins round one he felt at eight I don't know how and then we were sitting there and it was Mike Evans and then a big drop off and then McCaffrey was there I wanted McCaffrey I said I want this guy to catch his balls but this guy was convinced on Mike Evans oh. so that would be the biggest one but Mike Evans still had a good year 1500 yards you can't really like doubt that but yeah. McCaff McCaffrey so it kind of hurts but I, the biggest regret I'd say would probably be those middle rounds and I think taking T.Y. Hilton over a Juju yeah I think I did that in one I don't know why especially me because I was doing Juju but I think what it came down to I overthought the whole process and I was looking at stuff that that be, passing up on Juju in the third round in any league I think was my biggest regret I was yeah. scared about the AB taking targets and stuff like that but biggest regret right there probably yeah I took T.Y. in one of my league and also I mean you can't be necessarily that mad at T.Y. because I think he still has you know two or three really good years with Andrew Luck over the coming years um yeah, yeah oh so you did four startup dynasty leagues damn four. that's a lot and then I uh I trade it's fun to trade around those like I do a lot of I play NBA 2k and then when out there does and or even like Madden the GM mode and stuff you trade picks and it's kind of like that but in real fantasy yep so I was able to like finagle my way around and get Michael Thomas and Alvin Kamara on the same team Ooh. and then I just trade up Michael Thomas for Tyler Gurley so now I have Tyler Gurley and Kamara and that's fun to have just two studs and running back and then kind of the wide receiver corpse and whatnot but I also did over 50 best ball leagues so I was in a lot of those like I don't do expensive ones like the $10 ones I do like the $3 ones because mm -hmm. I think it's better than mock draft. It's like it helps me out for the whole entire redraft process, and it's like you can win money off it. So. Yeah, on draft.com, that's always like the site I tell my my followers to use. Like, yeah. you can load twenty bucks in and be good for for like two months off that because you could do dollar drafts, do dollar mock dollar best ball drafts, and those are just as serious as like other money leagues because people are still trying to win money and they still take those drafts like super serious. So um, that would definitely be a suggestion. Go do best ball. Go try out all these different uh these these different league types and i was in i think maybe four dynasty leagues this year but like three of them were with people that i didn't really know and i kind of got like random invites so i actually dropped them after this year and i'm like i want to start a couple new startup dynasty leagues with like people that i know so it's more enjoyable um i did one start up with my subscribers this year and uh i went so wide receiver heavy because i know you know the value of wide receivers is a lot higher in dynasty leagues but i was legitimately like streaming running backs all year and i somehow made it to the playoffs like at one point uh i believe i was starting two 49er running backs and neither of them were named matt Breida. like it was really it was really fucking bad um but yeah i ended up getting to the playoffs just because my pass cat i hit on like all five of my first five pass catchers that i drafted um and now i'm sitting with the 101 or i had the 101 and i need running backs obviously but there's no good running backs in this year's draft class um I'm just like fucking venting right now, but yeah, dynasty leagues are a lot of fun, I, man. 
trade that pick away when it comes to prime draft season after the draft and stuff, I'd wait and just package that with a player to upgrade it because people will overpay for it. Because already like, you saw like people hated this 2019 draft class, and then all of a sudden right now people are like, wait, maybe it's not that bad. I still think it's bad. I'll be passing. I'll try to trade my picks away for stuff. I, but. Yeah, so what I did, uh, I actually already moved that. I had the 101. I had the 101 because during the actual startup draft, I traded a few of my picks for future first-round picks. I moved the 101 uh, for the 105, and then I got Royce Freeman uh, and Christian Kirk. And I gave up, uh, was it Zay Jones? Zay Jones and Deshaun Hamilton, I think. So I swapped. I ended up getting Christian. I'm, I'm a really big fan of Christian Kirk, and uh, I think Royce Freeman will get a much bigger role with the new coaching staff there. So um, moving back four picks plus all the guys at the top are wide receivers, so I can still get one of the better wide receivers and or a running back of my pick in the draft. So I'm cool with that. Yeah, works out. Injuries suck too. I also recommend doing super flex dynasty leagues. I feel like it's more uh, people. I don't. I'm in two of them, which I don't know anyone in, and they've overvalued the crap out of quarterbacks, which kind of sucks. But I think it allows you to get. Uh, different values for different players in Superflex leagues, so definitely, I say at least get one of those, if not a normal one. Yeah, and that's a you know that's another kind of league type that a lot of people don't use. I mean, it's still for the most part, it's a setting within a league type, but Superflex is almost a whole different league type in its own. Um, and that's something that I know a lot of starting to kind of move towards the mainstream. Um, but that's something I definitely suggest trying out for anyone that hasn't, uh, as well as like tight tight end premium leagues in leagues where like or starting like two tight ends i think is cool or eliminating tight end and making like a wide receiver slash tight end flex spot um because like you're really fucked if you don't have kittle uh Ertz or kelsey you know what i mean like it's like what are you supposed to do at that tight end spot you're streaming 3.1 points a week it's a pain in the ass it's very annoying so yeah definitely different league heads are cool i was always against super flex before and then my biggest league moved to it and i didn't really have a say but after doing like the first few years i actually like it more because the people watching like the podcast and videos are gonna be smarter than their uh, opponents whatnot and if you know your stuff that gives you more of an advantage in those kind of leagues i think than a regular league because regularly you can kind of just follow adp in a way and still get a good team whereas super flex it's harder to follow the adp and you can definitely capitalize on people's fuck up yeah, and it's just like you actually have to analyze quarterbacks. Otherwise, if you're doing a one quarterback league, you don't have to worry about the position. You can go in the draft, not take a quarterback, and then get Matt Ryan in the 14th round, having not looked at a single thing to do with quarterbacks. That's what kind of pissed me off. So all y'all, it's basically like if you were playing in standard leagues and then you switch to half PPR, you're like, I'm never going back. That's kind of what one quarterback to super flex leagues really is. And I punted it in my biggest league, and I got Big Ben as the 18th quarterback off the board, and Mahomes is a 22nd quarterback off the board. And Ooh. I love that. I was like, yeah, I'll do that any day of the week. So I had the two best, those top three quarterbacks, and then my team flunked because of Rob Gronkowski. We're not going to talk about him, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I had. My big money league, I had uh, Mahomes, who I got in, like, the ninth round, and Andrew Luck was a keeper for, like, a 15th round pick. So I had actually, like, fucking stacked the QB. But um, right there. Yeah, that was, yeah, I that think was, Matt Ryan finished this too. Matt Ryan finished it. I think it was Matt too. Ryan too. Yeah. Wow. Um, so yeah, talking about trades though, because you make a lot of trades in dynasty leagues, but specific to redraft leagues, man, when it comes to trades, a lot of people like are like are pretty big. Uh, they're just annoying when it comes to trades. Like the, the trade offers that people receive, there's nothing more annoying than receiving a trade offer and the person like thinking they're outsmarting you or finagling you with a ridiculous offer. When it comes to trades, the way I look at it is you're not, like, for the most part, unless you drafted really well and you have a ton of depth, you're not really going to win a trade. Um, When you look at trades, don't go into it being like, I'm going to outsmart this guy. Trades are going to have to be won from both sides. Like, both guys have to feel like they've won the trade in order for that to work out. And I think people are hesitant to trade unless they feel like they completely outright won the trade, which kind of pisses me off. Yeah, that's... Definitely, I uh, like that a lot because I'm know that my dad hates me because of my trades I make in the leagues. Like, I think it's also because it's all a mental game. To be like, you're with a league of friends, you can kind of manipulate them in a way, like you know, with words and whatnot, and like give them some facts and whatnot, and try to get the trades done. But in the other leagues where I don't know anyone, I can't do that. So you like fair offers is the only way it's gonna get done. Because if you get an offer, say McCaffrey, you're trying to get, and you give him like Kevin Coleman and even Mike Evans, like that's not exactly yeah. fair because you're gonna be a capper you gotta look at it from their perspective and i think it's more fun doing i guess not equal trades maybe a slight advantage to you because obviously you're trying to win a trade 
but don't give them like a bull crap offer. That's just not fun, and it, it hurts you down the line in a way because no one's gonna want to trade with you. And he's, even if you give him a good offer, he's gonna be like, "No, nah, you tried raping me before, or whatnot." So he's like, I can't give you those players. So I think definitely try to get value on both sides. And he's like I said, not winning the trade, but getting guys to help your team better. And I think the biggest thing is people in home league, especially, have like those untouchable players. When in reality, you're gonna have to get good players to get good players. You can't get up your bench players for someone else to start. Yeah, exactly. It's not gonna work like that. Yeah, so, so definitely, it's just like a mindset change. Like people need to just stop doing that shit because it's super yeah. fucking annoying. Um. Scary. <laughs> so we'll talk about quarterbacks, I guess. I don't. I'm not even really sure why what I had on this list, but I I kind of wrote down that quarterbacks, with the exception of elite and guys that are anti-elite, the really bad quarterbacks and the really good pass throwers, will be just about as good as the weapons around them. Uh, for instance, you know. If you're going to put Jared Goff in this offense behind his elite offensive line, yes, he's going to be a good fantasy quarterback. He's not going to he's not more talented than someone who might finish as quarterback 22, but the situation is bad. Like for instance, going into last year, like people were kind of high on like Alex Smith as a late round quarterback in like super flex leagues or whatnot, but if you kind of just look at the team around him, it's like what weapons does he have? So, for the most part, you know, if if you're not in the top of the range, like if you're not taking the Aaron Rodgers or the or the Patrick Mahomes and all those guys from my like quarterback 6 to quarterback 16 fall into the same kind of field, the guy with the best weapons around him, the best playmakers and the best offensive line is the guy who's going to end up producing the most. Yeah, and I think you hit on that example huge cuz Alex Smith is among super flexers favorite like QB2 cuz you get him so late and whatnot, but like at the end of the day, this just comes back to a bunch of punching made situation. Just overrules it. Like you see players and you see who they have. You're only gonna be as good as the people you have around you. Alex is a perfect example. And I guess it also goes back to the preseason doubting him through Breeze. People had him outside the top ten and stuff. But if you look at the situation, you got a good old line. You got Michael Thomas. You got Alvin Kamara, and then you got Traquan Smith and Ted Ginn who can catch passes. So like nothing's really changed in that sense. So people doubted him. I didn't really understand that. I guess they saw the past attempts drop off but yeah it's like with, with that setup like how bad of a game could you possibly have on a week-to-week -week basis like you know michael thomas is going to go over 100 yards multiple times you know kamar is going to go over 100 yards through the air multiple times like all these players who are going to get a lot of yards through the air but somehow what breeze is not going to have those yards like it doesn't make sense so it's sometimes it's no, just so not as hard homes too people my dad was one of the doubters who's saying no nah, he's not going to do good uh it's a new rookie quarterback potentially I'm like, well, look at the situation. You got Tyreek Hill, who you saw last year with Alex Smith go off. You had, you had Kareem Hunt, not anymore. And then you got <laughs> Travis Kelsey. It's hard to fail in that situation. And that yeah. was my dad's case for Eli Manning, too. And you saw Eli towards the end of the year put up decent fantasy numbers. Not in real life. I'm a Giants fan, so don't even get me started about that. But like, you <laughs> saw him win you weeks because of the volume and like just him throwing the ball to Saquon and just having Saquon do all the work. That's a good point. Yeah, I mean, the O-line, which will actually transition to the next thing, is just as important. Like, when I say, you know, they're only going to be as good as the weapons around them, I also, you know, it's just the whole supporting cast, the bad O-line. If you have a quarterback who's behind a good O-line with good weapons, even if they're not an elite uh, thrower, they're going to be fine as a streaming quarterback um, in that sense. So just think about, you know, sometimes it doesn't have to be that hard. Sometimes, you know, if you're getting too cute with the numbers and analyzing things like that, just go with, just go with the player in the better situation. And that, that O line, I looked at it this year. I always look at the PFF O line rankings, and I kind of base some of the stuff off that. But I think if you have a top ten O line, that doesn't get enough credit from where it's actually due. You saw C.J. Anderson get cut by two teams, come on the Rams in this situation, and look at him back to back, the hundred plus yard games. And then you have Damian Williams, who I think is a good running back, but like people, he's the backup of Miami. He's, like you said, Adam Gaze is stupid. We we already know that, but. <laughs> This guy comes in here and he's just been going off and they signed him to a two-year deal. And that's because Kansas City's offensive line and offensive system is just that good. And Gurley's success comes from his O-line. And see, O-line heavy, I guess you could kind of say. Yeah, that that's it's that could be kind of tricky, though, because I think that it is similar to the quarterback situation where it's hard to correctly analyze O-lines unless they're in the very top you know, like top six or bottom six, because, you know, there's been a lot of times where we went into the year and been like, oh, this O-line's like good, right? They're supposed to be pretty good. And then maybe they'll go into the year as like the number nine line and end up as 17, you know, and that, that won't produce good fantasy numbers. Michael, 
Yeah, Oakland was ranked like I think four, and they performed bottom twenty. I think the Falcons so, too. The, the Falcons just a couple of years ago were like top three, and then just out of nowhere, you know, that shit just falls off. So I mean, the Rams, yeah, like they're an elite offensive line. So whoever's in that system is going to prosper. Kansas City, just Andy Reid's play calling and just that system, it, they're going to prosper. Um, it's another thing just not to think too hard about. But yeah, I mean, O lines are going to are make or break the running back and, and the system um, for the most part. I gotta make a flow chart before next year's draft, and the first thing's gonna be: Is the O line good? Yes or no? If it's yes, you follow down. Is the quarterback like a decent quarterback? That not it may work. I'm gonna try it out. I'm That's gonna do a, it. Make an infographic. I bet that'll go viral on Twitter. I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll share it with the audience. Um, and then I think we're kind of on the last one, unless anything else popped into your head as we were talking. But this was something that I. Uh, you got something? This is, my, this is my dad. No, this is number 11 that we have written down. It's my dad's favorite thing that he says all the time. And it's my dad's just personality, I guess. You're going to get a lot of shit wrong. Like, a lot of shit wrong. And, Thanks. like, my dad even says, experts in the fantasy industry, what, what do they know? They don't know any better than us. They're using the same thing we're doing. They're doing their research and whatnot and basing it off of that. We're doing our research based off their research and whatnot. And it doesn't matter. We're not going to be able to predict the future. If we did that, then everyone would be in the stock market making money. But it doesn't work <laughs> like that. So it's harder to predict the future, and I'm gonna get stuff wrong more times than not. Like, probably, I'm I'm always wrong. I tweeted the other day. I don't know anything. I don't. <laughs> yes, I'm giving you guys, everyone, like all these the podcasters and authors and stuff, just giving them you our, I guess, educated or non-educated opinions, and you guys can take it with a grain of salt because we're gonna be wrong, just like you're gonna be wrong. I'm pretty sure no one's ever had like a perfect draft where they hit on all 16 players. So I'm sure it's happened. But, but that is the that is the exclusion, not the rule. Yeah, it's something I was saying last video. It's like, listen, if you hit on 55 or 60% of the things that you do right, you are in the minority and you probably had a very good year. So that being said, know that, you know, some of your strongest takes are going to be wrong. So. Oh, oh, don't get me started. Diversify. <laughs> diversify. Always diversify because you are going to be wrong. And don't be a fucking asshole coming at me in my comments about how I'm wrong and you're right because you're going to be wrong a lot of the time too. I'm glad I'm not that big or like the podcast isn't that big enough to where I have that much viewer feedback because me and Chris Hogan, he's got a special place in my heart now. If I ever met him, I'd say go back to lacrosse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had some, I had some bad uh, Chris Hogan content out on the web. 100%. 100% ownership. I was so in on him. And all the stats that we had lined up, I wasn't the only one. Evan Silva was in on him. You had, uh, I believe, Brad Evans was in on him. All these big-name guys were in on him for rightfully so. You that's saw what he that's did. the toughest part. It's like some things, you know, you could look back on and talk about the lessons that you learned, but at the end of the day, what was the difference between David Johnson and Saquon Barkley's situation? Bad quarterback, bad offensive line, like both going to yeah. get a, a ton of work, but like, it's just something you can't predict. It could have just as easily went uh, David Johnson blowing up and Squan Barkley not. Looking back on it, it's easy to be like, well, Squan Barkley is fucking, you know, whatever. He, it, like that's that's the tough part about it. It, it is hard to look back and uh, and kind of grasp these lessons sometimes. But we do the best that we can because uh, that's all we really can do with with what we have at hand. So um, that being said, this kind of wraps up everything from the 2018 fantasy football season. Um, any Parting words, Justin. Anything you want to leave the people with? Who's your uh, Super Bowl pick? Let's get that out of the way. Uh, so wait, this is gonna be okay. This will be out Friday, so my other video will be out already. So me and my friends who have been doing our uh, our fade the public podcast are are tied up right now in terms of our pick 'em for the playoffs. The we all went Patriots. We all went Patriots, but then. As I sent my videos off to my editor, I like, I, I uh, fucking videotaped myself in my phone, and I was like, you know what? I'm changing my pick. Make sure you include this video clip in the <laughs> in the video that's coming out tomorrow, or whatever. And I changed to the Rams. And when I look at it, here's here's why. Like, okay, we'll play a game right now. Whose defensive line are you gonna take, Rams or Patriots? Better defensive line. I'm picking the Rams in that one. Of course. You know, we're just, we're going to go down the line. Rams or Patriots? Uh, D-backs. Rams or Patriots? Rams. Linebackers. I'd say Patriots right now, to be you, honest with you. You could take that. Um, they, they're playing really well. Wide receivers. 
that's this is the thing. That system for the Patriots is insane. Look, t- talent wise, I'd give it to the Rams, but Brady has to put the ball four yards down the field. Running backs don't matter, but I would still say Rams either way. Uh, offensive line, Rams. The way I look at it is, dude. Uh, the Rams win on ev- almost every part of the field. Like, they are the better team in almost every aspect of the field. And, I, yeah, it's Brady, I guess, but I, I wouldn't say Brady is better than Jared Goff at this point in terms of pure, like, talent. So, I don't know. I, I, I think it's just hard to argue that. So, uh, yeah, I'm a Giants fan. I hate the Patriots. I hate – like, I have, well, I went to UMass Amherst, so I'm used to – I will transfer but, like, I have a bunch of Patriots fans. I've been texting them and stuff. Brady's 41, whatever, and I'm not. Yeah, he's playing like crap, but I, in my head, I want them to lose. I'm putting money on the Patriots to win, though, just because I'm always wrong with this shit. I'm always wrong. Well, right? I have to, 80% nobody. of the money, 80% of the money, and 80% of the bets are on the on the Patriots, so I have to fucking fade the public with the Rams. Like, yeah. this, if there's ever been a fade the public moment, like, this is it. This, this is it. Do you think that Brady loses two in a row, though? I don't. I don't know about that. That's the only thing that factor. You can do. He's had that much experience too. I don't Brady know, like, shouldn't. I don't know how bad Nerms are. Brady shouldn't even be in the fucking Super Bowl. Like they picked off that they ball. Can, they picked off that ball, and then you're looking at, oh, Brady had a horrible conference championship game with three interceptions, and you're like, eh, like this is over. You know, the Patriots run is done there. But whatever. Who is it? Justin Houston. Uh, was he the one who know, fucking lined up offsides? It wasn't Houston. It, it was someone else. He was in the Pro Bowl. He always does that, and they called it that one time. I thought it was bullshit. Uh, he was, I was like saying, he was like seven feet over the fucking line. Like they that, they so absolutely should have called it. Yeah, but I don't know what the fuck is he doing. Like what are you doing lining up I, all the way? I don't there? know. Patriots cheat. Bill Belichick. I, I don't like him. But it's just, funny because my Giants, my my friends that are Giants fans, want the Patriots to win so that they could be like. No, they like it because then they could so be more like of a case that you can say, "Oh, he's zero and three against NFC East quarterback, and zero two against Eli." Yeah, that'd be uh, yeah. It's it's tough. I just don't know. I feel like you saw that playoff uh, in the the playoff drive he had in the uh, not playoff, the overtime drive. Yeah, I see. Down it. I've seen like it. That it makes no I sense. I don't know. I just feel like we'll see. I'm hoping that the Rams win, but I'm wrong. I'm always wrong. I think I just bad luck or something like that. So I'm gonna put money on the Patriots. So if they do lose, the win win. I don't care. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fair enough. I'm gonna fade the Last public. Parting. I'm going with Rams. Yeah. Last parting word: Saquon's better than Zeke. I have Cowboys fans. Is that true? You agree? That's not even close. Saquon's the best running back in the league. It's not even fucking. Thank you. It's not even. It's. I don't even think it's. Like. <laughs> he's doubly just, as good as a raw talent as anyone any uh, running back in the league right now. It's fucking absurd. Imagine. Imagine if. Imagine if he was behind the Cowboys offensive line. Oh my god. Wow. Like Met- if he could have a like, I don't know. We could have a what? That's up. If we had an offensive line, uh, we're not going to. The Giants never will for a while. No. So, I don't know. We're going to probably take away half. And then the last thing I say is we got to make it a movement. Josh Allen is the human highlight reel. That's the new name for the guy. No. Josh Allen, he does, he, yeah. he's, done, he's done after two more years. He's yeah, out of he, the league. He's the meme train, dude. I'm just going to keep rolling with him. This dude <laughs> just, it's just done somehow. He's my favorite. He's going to be the come to the podcast meme. The human highlight reel. Fuck that. Official. Fuck that. He's, he's Blake. He's just reincarnated Blake Bortles, bro. He's gonna be done. You can't be that bad at throwing the ball and just and and excel as a quarterback. It's just not gonna happen. All right, so that's gonna wrap up. That's it. That's gonna wrap up the episode. Uh, Justin, thank you for joining me. Uh, where can they Where can they find your stuff? Yeah, thanks for having me. And, if they uh, want to hear your fucking like, bullshit Josh Allen takes anymore. If they want to hear my, my great Josh Allen takes and my Saquon takes, uh, uh, Twitter is at JustinFSFF. And, uh, yeah, I do a podcast. We haven't really done one in a while because taking the off-season rest time. My dad's taking very good pride in that, taking on vacation. So I do it with my dad, but, like, I guess we're good. We're, we're not good. We're just, we're just entertainment more so. Yeah, I, I, I uh – I did. They get the big the big dog approval. Um, wouldn't have brought him on, obviously, if I didn't think he did good work. Hardworking, consistent. I uh, appreciate that. So make sure you go check out his podcast. Make sure you go give him a follow on Twitter. Make sure all y'all go fucking make a Twitter account that doesn't have it. If I get if this video gets fucking 2,000 views and I don't have 2,000 new followers, all right, well, some of y'all already had a Twitter account. If, he, if he's not up to 1,000 followers by the time this fucking video is out, we got problems. I'm blocking everybody. I'm blocking all y'all. If you're not subscribed to this channel, you're watching this video and you're just watching it, it's like leave it a like, help him out. Why not? He's making this content for you and subscribe because it doesn't hurt you in any way. Like if, if you don't want those notifications, just put it into the spam folder. But you'll see him go live. Give him a subscriber account. It doesn't hurt anything. It's, it takes like two seconds to do. Right now, do it. Hit the escape button. Done. Do full screen. Scroll down a little bit. God damn. Just God click damn. the subscribe button. <laughs> it's not that hard, people. This guy's speaking big facts right now. I might need to hire his ass. Yeah, straight facts. That's all it is. Just. 
All right, we out of here. Thumbs up, subscribe, peace.